All right, I think we'll uh, get started now. Uh, the topic uh, today, uh, a priorism and positive in, in the social sciences, is a rather abstract one. I thought uh, wouldn't be a very popular lecture. I was considering trying to, as an incentive to get people to come to the lecture, I was considering passing out copies of the written exam uh, be given, but I didn't think uh, that would go over too well with the people administering the program, so I, I didn't do that. Uh, I should say some of the material that I'm giving in this lecture will repeat points I made in the first lecture I gave on praxeology. Uh, this is a difficult topic, and I don't think, I think, uh, Hearing the same thing uh, an, another time is sometimes helpful in learning. It reminds me, like most things, I'm old now and I always have stories. Uh, my favorite teacher at UCLA was Walter Starkey. And once he was giving a lecture and someone put up his hand and said to him, uh, you're giving the same lecture as you gave last time. And he said, that's the trouble with you Americans. You never want to hear the same thing twice. <laughs> and just uh, one addition to that is I saw a couple years ago, there was a biography of uh, Jessica Mitford, who was one of the famous uh, Mitford sisters in England, and mentioned she had been on a, was going on her first lecture tour of the United States in the 1930s. It, in the book, it said she'd gotten a letter from her friend, Walter Starkey at Trinity College, Dublin, which said, you have to be careful. Americans never want to hear the same thing twice. So uh, at least he was consistent. Now, uh, to uh, what I want to talk about today is, uh, we'll start with a claim that uh, Mises makes was, a, I think, a very significant philosophical claim. He says that uh, economics can contribute to epistemology. Epistemology is the uh, theory of knowledge. Uh, philosophers, at least at the time he was writing, don't study economics much. There are uh, you can get various books dealing with philosophy of economics, but those books usually don't claim that economics, studying economics can help you understand uh, general problems of epistemology. But Mises makes this claim. Uh, and what is the nature of the claim that he's making when he says that uh, economics can help us uh, contribute to epistemology. He says that the economics comes up with general laws. We have laws of economics that you've studied in the lectures this week, law of supply and demand, law of diminishing marginal utility, and so on. But the way these laws are arrived at, the way we prove these laws is different from the way laws are established in the physical sciences. Uh, now, uh, I should say, when Mises claims that economics can make a contribution to epistemology, he isn't confining himself to Austrian economics. He means a standard price theory of a sort that you would get in... Uh, regular e neoclassical economic uh, as well, or at least uh, economics that was taught at his time. I think nowadays it would be much more mathematical and used a different method. But he had in mind economics at the time he was writing and before kind of standard price theory. And he thought that the way economics proceeds what was making a contribution to the theory of knowledge. Now, if he's right, we have a problem is that he says that 
economics is making a contribution to the theory of knowledge, but why hasn't this been studied much by philosophers? Uh, if you read books on epistemology at around the time he was writing, you won't find discussions of economics. And Mises had an explanation for this. He said that uh, there are many people who don't uh, like the notion of economic law uh, because this limits what the government can do. For example, uh, suppose that uh, people, the economy is in uh, not doing very well. So some people say, well, uh, the way to solve that is to just have the government print money, then everybody will be prosperous. In the early 1930s, there was a uh, Huey Long in Louisiana had a program, Every Man a Millionaire, where he proposed giving everybody uh, very large amounts of money. Sounds like a good idea, but there are economic laws that uh, show that that wouldn't it wouldn't succeed in uh, attaining the ends of making everybody prosperous. So many people don't want there to be economic laws because this restricts what they can do, uh, even though one might think uh, what people do would be, should take account of existing scientific knowledge. Many people don't have that attitude. Uh, they put one in mind of the, people have that attitude, put one in mind of the man who read so much about how bad smoking is for your health that he gave up reading. <laughs> uh, uh, now, in the uh, physical sciences, uh, as Mises presented them, uh, people are, uh, were studying matter in motion. For example, take a very simple example. In Boyle's Law, we have the pressure on a, uh, of a gas times the volume will equal a constant. So we get this law by experimenting and we find that that's true, but we're not, <clears throat> when we say this, we're not attributing uh, conscious purposes to the particles. We're not saying, if you have particles with gas, we're not saying, well, one particle will say, well, I have to adjust the volume. I have to uh, go apart from the uh, another uh, particle so that the, this equation will turn out to be true. This will just be a description of how the particles, in fact, uh, operate. They won't be saying, to, the particles won't be thinking to themselves, how do I maintain this relationship? So what we have in physical sciences, we're simply studying, uh, looking at particles in motion, and trying to come up with laws about them. Uh, now, uh, what Mises says, well, in the human sciences, especially in economics, matters are different because we're not limited to observing people just as physical bodies. <coughs> excuse me, as physical bodies, we people have purposes. We know uh, from just by uh, thinking of our own actions, and we can see actions of others. Uh, <coughs> we know people act in the meaning by that, that they have purposes that they want to achieve. People have uh, means, they use means to attain ends. So we we can use that fact that we, uh, we know that human beings have purposes to come up with laws in a different way. We're not limited just to observing people as if they were a collection of material particles and then just noting their motions. There are people who've tried to do this. Uh, one could take behaviorist psychology as an attempt to do that, just to limit uh, our study of human, what human beings are, are doing to external behavior. You, you all know the story of the two behaviorist psychologists 
who met each other on the street, and one said to the other, uh, you're fine, how am I? <laughs> uh, I? I must say I'm glad you laughed at that. I told that story to uh, Friedrich Hayek in around in 1969, he laughed also. So. <laughs> now, uh, there are some people who would question what Mises said, not on the grounds that they deny that uh, human beings act, but they think uh, Mises shouldn't have made a separation between the physical world and uh, uh, human beings. That some people think you can attribute purposes to nature. Also, there were German philosophers in the 19th century. Uh, Friedrich Schelling is one who thought that uh, there were purposes in nature. Now, uh, for most of these, and it wasn't that they thought that there was purpose in the sense that uh, there were Nate, there were minds in nature say, that were acting consciously, but s uh, some philosophers thought we could apply the notion of purpose without thinking of a mind. We could have what's called a natural teleology. We could attribute purpose to matter in various ways. This is a position, of course, uh, Aristotle had that view, and there are many uh, people who hold that view even today. There is, a, for example, uh, Thomas Nagel is one who is very attracted to that view that there's there can be purposes in nature without claiming that nature is mental. But whether you agree with that or not, it doesn't alter the fact that uh, there we people do act and we can, if Mises is right, come up with laws based on being aware of that, being aware that human beings act and not viewing human beings as if they were simply collections of material particles. Uh, uh, <clears throat> now, uh, when we say that human beings act. There's nothing mysterious about this. It's we, this is something we grasp right away, as I say, from our own uh, knowledge. of We know we have purposes and we act and we can see other people acting. One uh, mistake I think people make, it's a very dubious philosophical move, they think, well, all I can really know, see is certain motions of people's bodies. It's just an inference that other people have minds or purposes or act, but I'm not really directly aware of that. Well, I see no reason to adopt that view. It's not a theory that people act. It's something that we gr directly grasp in, in experience. We know that people act. It's uh, it's a, a given, what Mises calls an ul ultimate given. And uh, there's nothing mysterious about thinking, uh, about thinking that we can use, con we need certain concepts like the concept of action to understand what people are doing. Uh, consider this analogy. Suppose someone's talking in a foreign language that you don't know. Uh, you would have to learn the language to be able to understand what they were saying. So in a similar way, unless we have the concept of action, we wouldn't be able to make sense of what people are doing. And Mises' essential argument is, since we can make sense of what people are doing, we can do so only we we have the concept of action. That shows that our concept can be used to give us real knowledge of what's going on in the world. Uh, as I uh, just say, these concepts are ones that we we have to grasp in order to understand what's going on. We wouldn't have, we, if we didn't have a concept of action, then 
it would be, it, the world wouldn't make sense to us, or at least the world of human action wouldn't make sense to us. Uh, uh, we would be faced with what William James called a booming, buzzing confusion. <clears throat> we wouldn't know what was going on. One uh, point to avoid here, when we say we have to have these concepts in order to understand human action, I don't mean by that that these concepts are biologically innate. This is a logical claim. We wouldn't understand what was going on unless we had the concept. We're not making a claim of uh, how, uh, sort of claim about the human brains or how <clears throat> people came up with the concept. So it isn't a question of innate ideas. It's just saying we need to have these concepts in order to understand uh, what people are doing. Uh, now, uh, this, uh, this, when we study action in this way, uh, this is what a uh, study of human action by thinking about the concept of action, this is what Mises meant when he spoke of praxeology, the science of action. We're using the concept of action in order to understand what human beings are doing. In his earlier writings, which uh, you can find in the collection Epistemological Problems of Economics, uh, he uses the term sociology for this general science of action, but then he later adopted praxeology in, instead. And people, this, what I want to suggest to you, however counterintuitive it might seem, is that uh, this notion of a priori concept is really not very hard to understand at all. People make it much harder than it is. Uh, they think of a priori as equivalent to mental. So they'll think, well, if you have an a priori concept, it's about some idea in your own mind. But this isn't, this isn't the case. Uh, that when you all what you mean when you talk about an a priori concept is you, a certain idea that you need to make sense of some aspect of the world, but it isn't, and in the case of human action, it isn't making sense of what's going on in your own mind. It's making sense or trying to make sense of what's going on in the world. Now, uh, here, and again, this will, I mentioned this in the first lecture, uh, there was a famous problem raised by uh, Descartes, the great uh, 16th century French philosopher, that how do we know that we have any knowledge of the external world? He, of course, famously said, well, he, he said he can't doubt that he's thinking if he doubted, well, if he doubted that, his doubt is a form of thinking, so he can't doubt that he's thinking. And from that, uh, from that, he tried to prove the existence of God, and from that, he tried to show we have reason to accept the existence of the external world, at least when we're thinking clearly and distinctly about it. This is a very interesting philosophical project. It's been continued by many later philosophers, a problem of skepticism. But this is not Mises' problem. Mises is not concerned with the philosophical <coughs> issue of skepticism. And many people, uh, I've had students come up and say, uh, make, ask questions like, well, how does Mises get from what's going into what's in his own mind to anything about the external world. This is not what he's concerned with. In the sciences, we take for granted the existence of the external world. Uh, say we don't in, uh, in physics, if we're studying the, uh, the uh, inner composition of the earth, uh, we don't ask, how do we know there is an earth at all? Or how do we know that <clears throat> there are or observations or anything other than mental, those questions just don't arise in the, in the sciences. Uh, so uh, 
again, this is covering what I, I've already said. What Mises is saying is, given that we do understand action, we see actions all the time, say, I'm giving a lecture now, uh, other pe people are listening to the lecture, or uh, I hope, but uh, this is something that we know is taking place. So what we're doing in uh, <clears throat> praxeology is attempting to explain this. Again, we're not in praxeology starting with the what's going on in our own mind and then saying, how do we know that there are other minds or other actors? This is, this is resting on the false assumption that praxeology is about the human mind rather than action in the world. Uh, now, <clears throat> we now come to, uh, that's perhaps been uh, not the most interesting topic, but we now get a bit more lively because <clears throat> we can come up with the opposition to Mises. It's always, I think, in fun in philosophy when you get struggles or battles between conflicting groups. And Mises' uh, chief opponents in, uh, in methodology, people who denied his claim that economics give you this special method of proceeding by a priori knowledge, were the logical positivists or the Vienna circle. Uh, this was a group that had started, was started by the uh, Moritz Schlick, who was a professor of philosophy at the University of Vienna. And there were, he had a group of, of philosophers who met with him. Uh, they included Rudolf Carnap, who was a, became a, a very, it was a famous philosopher of language, and he wrote on mathematical logic. Uh, there were others. Friedrich Weismann was in the group. He was a friend of Wittgenstein, who sometimes met with the positivists, and uh, Otto Neurath who was the one Mises really hated. He, he couldn't stand. There, there were various other people in the group. Uh, I should say, uh, if you look at the, uh, most, of, most of the positivists were very left-wing politically. Uh, uh, Otto Neurath had been a minister in the Bavarian Soviet Republic, which had taken power very briefly in uh, Bavaria in the 1920s. Most of them were very left-wing, but uh, Schlick himself was a classical liberal, but I, he was probably the only one. There were, uh, the mathematician, great mathematician, Kurt Gödel, uh, met with, uh, sometimes sat in on the group, but he wasn't a positivist. He was also very left-wing politically. He was sympathetic to Trotsky. Uh, just as... Uh, Digression, uh, Schlick's career illustrates some of the perils of academic life. Uh, one of his uh, students, who was a PhD student of his, uh, had some grievance. It isn't clear what the grievance was, uh, but he, he was really upset with Schlick. His name was uh, Nelbach, was the last name. And he... He went to the uh, University of Vienna and he uh, expressed his discontent with Schlick in a rather dramatic fashion. Uh, he shot him dead. <laughs> uh, so, so then uh, he was then imprisoned. And then uh, during the World War II, you know, a a or a after the uh, Anschluss, which was the takeover of, of by Germany of Austria in March 1938, uh, uh, that Nelbach applied for release on the grounds that he had been trying to get uh, rid of a Jewish positivist. But Schlick wasn't Jewish, but he he was paroled anyway, and I think he he wound up his career. I think he lived uh, in he lived after the war into the early 1950s, he worked as a forest ranger. Uh, but so, as I say, you have to be very careful in uh, 
if you're teaching, I mean, I try to avoid arguments with students. Uh, so, uh, what the the part the basic idea of the positivist was opposition to metaphysics. Uh, what do we mean by metaphysics? Well, this uh, uh, is the contention that just by thinking about the world we can come up with theories of its nature that tell us something significant. Uh, Leibniz uh, would be an example of people, a uh, philosopher who held that view. Leibniz held that the world really consists of what he called monads, which are spiritual, small spiritual substances. And, uh, the entire world is composed of these monads. We think they appear to be, to us, to be uh, physical objects, but these are just what Leibniz called well-founded appearances. Uh, there aren't really physical objects. Uh, uh, one very interesting 20th century philosopher was like that, was a uh, British idealist, John McTaggart, who in his book, Nature of Existence, said he started with the statement, something exists, and from that statement, he claimed to deduce that the world consists of minds, in, entirely of minds that uh, exist eternally, and that time and the world of physical objects is just an illusion. So the logical positivist said, this is really... Uh, you won't get anywhere this way. You can't get knowledge just by thinking about things to uh, without uh, empirical testing. The only way we can get knowledge is through the method of the physical sciences. Uh, now, Mises thought in a, that that was their their main program was opposing metaphysics. Mises thought they had an additional uh, motive in mind that they wanted to get rid of economic knowledge. Uh, that they because since they were most of them were socialists, and Mises had shown by the socialist calculation argument that socialism can't work. He thought that they wanted to uh, get uh, deny any knowledge but the physical sciences so they could get rid of economics. And, uh, the one I mentioned, Otto Neurath, who was his particular, particular one he hated, was one he thought had that motive. Uh, so uh, what Mises said in to counter these positivists was uh, they said that you could only get knowledge through the physical sciences, but he said, well, what about economics? This is a science, and it uses different methods, a, a deductive method based on studying the concept of action. So he says, well, uh, the positivists are wrong because there's actually an example of a science that is not a physical science that gives you real knowledge. Uh, one thing... I should mention earlier is interesting when you look at Mises' views, he didn't disagree with the positivists about metaphysics. He rejected metaphysics too. That isn't part of, I mean, you, you could have different views about that. You could, you could think metaphysics really does give you knowledge and still be a praxeologist. But Mises didn't differ with the positivists on that point. He rejected metaphysics. And this would be a, a one instance in which Mises and Murray Rothbard uh, had different views because uh, uh, Murray Rothbard was an Aristotelian and Thomist in philosophy, so he would be much more sympathetic to metaphysics than Mises was. But in any event, Mises said, well, look, there's more to knowledge than the physical sciences because we have economics, which go, proceeds by a different method. Now, the positivists said to that, uh, economics, as Mises practices it, really isn't a science because economics doesn't meet what they call the requirements of what they call the verification principle. Uh, so 
what is the verification principle? Well, this is the view that any scientific statement, uh, one that claims to give you knowledge of the world, must be something that can be confirmed by sense experience. For example, uh, suppose I say uh, there are more than 10 people in this room. This would, we could, would meet the verification principle because I could count the number of people. And if there were more than 10 people, then I would have, that would be a verifiable statement. I mean, it, it, I could come up, uh, I could come up with a mistaken claim. Say I said there were a hundred people in this room. That would still meet the verification principle, even though it's incorrect. But as long as you can come up with uh, something that appealed to sense experience, then it passes the test. Now, there's a stronger version of the verification principle, it's strong in the sense of more demanding, that uh, some of the positivists adopted, which is not only that a state, uh, empirical state, statement, empirical statement, one claiming to give you knowledge of the real world, has to be confirmable by sense experience, but that the meaning of the statement is what is required to test it. So the meaning of the statement is what you do to test it, but this doesn't seem very plausible. Uh, for example, suppose uh, I say Caesar crossed the Rubicon River 49 BC. It doesn't seem at all plausible to think that what that statement means is that if I look up various history books or various records, I'll find the sentence, Caesar crossed the Rubicon River in 49 BC. That would be how I would verify it, but that's not what the statement means. Uh, now, you might think this wouldn't pose a problem for praxeology, because suppose I say, for example, uh, uh, you always choose your most highly valued preference. Say if I uh, have a choice between vanilla and chocolate ice cream, so I like vanilla better, at least at the particular time I'm choosing, so I pick that one. So couldn't I say, well, I verified the, the statement, I always choose my most highly valued preference because I... I did pick the vanilla rather than the chocolate, and I, that was the one I most highly valued. So the positivist said, no, that, that isn't good enough. That doesn't meet the standard, because uh, they said that Mises is claiming you can know this proposition a priori. You can know it to be true by thinking about it. It isn't that you examined a lot of your choices and you just found out you always happen to pick the one you prefer the most. Mises says, well, by thinking about the concept of action, then we, we, we grasp that it's true you pick your most highly valued preference. So the positivist Again, you see in philosophy, there's always a, a, a thesis, and then there'll be an opposition to that, and then counter objections. And keeps going as long as you want. There's always a reply in the works. So the positivist said, in response, uh, what Mises is giving here is just a tautology. He's just saying something that really isn't conveying any information. He's just defining <laughs> highest valued preference as the one you in fact choose. So what he's saying is when you, he says you choose your most highly valued preference, it's just you choose what you choose. This isn't really giving you any knowledge. It's just, it's certainly a true statement, but it doesn't get you any get you anywhere. Uh, but is that claim correct? Is what the positivists are saying correct? Uh, 
well, what again, what is a tautology? It's a, it's a definition or a part of a definition or a law of logic. So a tautology, as I just mentioned, doesn't give you any information about the world. To give an example that Wittgenstein uses in the Tractatus, uh, suppose you ask someone, what's the weather in a certain place? And the person tells you, it's either raining or it's not raining. So he hasn't really, what he says is true. It's just an application of a logical law. It's an instance of a logical law, but it doesn't tell you anything. So a definition, if you just define, uh, say, uh, the highest value choice is the one you, in fact, choose, it isn't really telling you anything. You can't learn something about the world just by defining a term in a certain way. I should just point out, just as a side point, there are philosophers who denied that at least some versions of the famous ontological argument do claim, for example, that by, from its definition of God, it follows that God exists. So that claim is controversial, but in any event, that's what the positivist said. You can't uh, gain knowledge of the world just by definition. Something, something can't be made true by defining it to be true. Uh, now, what Mises' response here was uh, that the positivists are just wrong about this. We do gain knowledge of the world just by thinking about things. And he gave us an example of uh, mathematics. We learn truths about the world by uh, thinking about mathematical concepts or proving theorems about mathematics. And according to the positivists, mathematics consists of tautologies, but they still give us how, on that view, could we explain how we get knowledge of the world? He says, it's just false that uh, uh, just by thinking about things, our knowledge is just a system of definitions, just a system of arbitrary concepts. So he said, he said, well, if the positivists are right, how could a, just a set of definitions give you knowledge about the world as mathematics obviously does? And he thought they couldn't explain that. I should say, now, uh, but what about the specific example I gave, uh, one about the preference, uh, you always choose your most highly valued preference. Uh, the response here is that it isn't that Mises is defining uh, uh, your highest valued preference as the one you, in fact, choose. Your highest valued preference would be uh, just something like you imagine you uh, have various actions available to you and you rank them in an order and the highest valued one would be the one you rank first. That isn't defining highest valued preferences, what you, in fact, choose. But the claim is when you th once you think about highest value preference, just characterizing that way, you'll grasp that it's true that that's the one you in fact choose. So he isn't, the positivists were wrong in the way both they examined that specific case and in the more general point that you can't get knowledge about the world just by thinking about it. Uh, so, uh, just a little bit more on the verification principle. I know this is a, we want to go on to something else. I know the verification principle is thrilling, but we do have to get on to other things. Uh, when uh, Mises is talking about a priori concepts, this is just a, a local matter in the sense that all he's claiming is that we need the concept of action in order to understand what human beings are doing in the world. He isn't making a general claim about all our knowledge, uh, that he isn't saying that all human knowledge requires a priori concepts. He's just talking about what's required for praxeology. Then uh, 
Another thing on the verification principle is famous criticism of it is it appears to be self-refuting. And it says, well, all true statements are either ones that are tautologies, a priori truths or tautology, or ones that are uh, true, empirically testable, but that statement doesn't appear to be one that's either uh, a priori true or one that's uh, capable of being uh, being testable. It's more of a proposal. If somebody, it's just the positivists were suggesting this, so someone could just say, "Well, okay, you propose it. We don't accept it," and they they wouldn't uh, we, they wouldn't have much response. Uh, now I have more on verification, but I think we'll uh, well. Uh, yeah, might as well go on with verification. I just can't tear myself away f from it. Uh, another, not that I haven't tried, uh, <laughs> but another problem with the verification principle is the positivists couldn't state it in a way that uh, got them where they wanted. Remember, what they wanted to do was to show that only scientific statements, only the uh, statements in physical sciences give you real knowledge about the world, and metaphysics is excluded. But they couldn't state the principle in a way that enabled them to have all and only scientific statements as the ones that were verifiable. There are various logical tricks that I won't go into that can show that for any formulation of the verification principle, you could uh, do various things to it to show that really everything can be is admitted under the principle. They they can't get it the way the way they want, but. Uh, I remember once uh, when I gave a lecture on this subject uh, in one of the early uh, Mises U's, uh, I mentioned this point. And, uh, you know, I said, I'm not going to go into the logical details. And Murray Rothbard was in the audience and says, like, eh, no, no, give, show us the proof. So I had to, I had to think, could I remember how to, do, how to do it? And I managed to come up with something. But uh, to me, the most, one of the simplest ways to uh, counter the verification principle is to just say, you, why should we accept this? It seems like just an arbitrary statement. Suppose you like metaphysics or you think there's something to it. Why should uh, somebody who uh, doesn't, uh, not predisposed to accept the verification principle, uh, give it any credence. It just seems like, suppose someone said, uh, for example, uh, uh, for a statement to be true, it has to be found in a particular book. Only statements in this book can be accepted as true. We would want to, uh, let's to avoid uh, difficulty, suppose that very statement is in the book, so we <laughs> avoid a certain problem. So we could still say, why should we accept such a, a principle? Uh, it's just arbitrary. Uh, there, there's no reason to go along with it. Uh, now, uh, I want to, in the last few minutes, I'll just, a couple of minutes, I'll just mention another objection to uh, a priori truth. This was raised by the great American philosopher, uh, W. V. O. Quine, and what he said was, uh, there aren't any a priori truths because every statement in principle is subject to refutation. Uh, we could always say he, he thought there were certainly principles we would be very reluctant to give up, uh, principles that he thought were at the core of science, but he thought that uh, in principle, everything could be uh, any statement could be overthrown by future experience. 
And he went so far, at least in some of his writings, although sometimes he was a bit hesitant on this, to extend this to the laws of logic themselves. He said, maybe we could imagine count, uh, think, uh, abandoning the laws of logic in certain cases. So, But that uh, seems, at least to me, although Quine was a great philosopher, that seems an implausible position to me. So I'll just finish up with the a story about Quine. Uh, 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 Robert Nozick was once upset that uh, there was a review of uh, his book, uh, Philosophical Explanations, that had come out by Carlin Romano, who was a pot, wrote on, uh, I think it was in Chronicle of Higher Education. So he it was a very negative review, and he showed it to Quine, and Quine said, uh, every knock a boost. Fortunately, that principle isn't reversible. So, uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, ha having, uh, I hope I haven't bored you unduly with the verification principle, so I think we'll stop at this point. Thanks. <laughs>